So let me begin by um, describing this from the context of um, representations of fundamental groups. So in this talk, sigma will be an oriented surface of um, closed surface of genus greater than one. Its fundamental group is has a standard presentation. Two G generators and one relation, which is product of commutators. And um, this is the topology side, the geometry side will be when we'll I'll assume that G is a Lie group. And over most of the time I'll stick to the real numbers, but everything I'm, I'm saying will um, also um, hold for complex Lie groups and we get homomorphic symplectic structures in this case. And I will, let me, <clears throat> in many cases, I'll assume that it's a reductive algebraic group. Um, but in order to get the symplectic structure, I'll need to assume that G is orthogonal. Right. Which means that the adjoint representation Representation of G G algebra preserves a non degenerate symmetric bilinear form. Or inner product. What is a reductive algebraic group? Okay, so by an algebraic group, I mean a, um, an affine algebraic group. So that means that it's like just a, a group of matrices that's defined by polynomial equations. So we have, um, for example, the, the special linear group. Well, the general linear group, one, the special linear group, all the classic groups are described by um, polynomials in the matrix entries. Um, reductive, it's maybe the simplest um, definition, I think, is to assume that it preserves a, um, a symmetric, a non degenerate symmetric bilinear form on its, uh, for, for matrix representation. Okay. Um, so, for example, this is a good example. You take if X and Y. It's in GLM, the algebra of the general linear group, just space of n by n matrices, the inner product x and y will just be the trace of the matrix product. So that's the natural inner product. When you take that for the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra, this is the killing form. And a semi-simple Lie algebra is one for which the um, Killing form is non degenerate. Okay, but this is considerably more general. And one of the questions that I'd like to raise is that what, what sort of symplectic manifolds arise when we take non, non, um, non reductive groups that have this orthogonal structure? So many nilpotent non abelian groups have this orthogonal structure. And um, a very general construction shows that if you take any Lie group, its cotangent bundle has a natural um, Lie group structure, which preserves a natural um, bi invariant, has, has such a form. This is equivalent to a bi invariant pseudo Riemann metric. So, so this seems to be considerably more general than 
reductive groups. Okay, so, so this is the general context. Most of the time, I'll be just talking about GLM. Okay. All right, so. So I'm interested in set of homomorphisms from this discrete group into the Lie group. And this is going to have a natural structure. So first of all, let me observe formal properties that if we have a homomorphism from pi into G, then composition with an automorphism of pi and an automorphism of G gives a new homomorphism. So this has an ot pi action. I'm particularly interested in structures that are preserved by that. So this is naturally maps into um, Cartesian product 2G copies one for each generator, namely take a representation phi and associate it to images on the generators. Um, <clears throat> because this is a generating set, this is injective. And furthermore, its image, which I'll always, are the ones that satisfy this equation that the product of commutators. is equal to the identity, the identity element of the group. So in particular, the image is an algebraic set. So remember, if G, let, let me think, just stick to the case where G is a, an algebra, a linear algebraic group, in which case this is just a group, a bunch of matrices. And this is a, a matrix equation it has to be satisfied. So these are all, and these are all polynomials in the matrix entries. Okay, so that's the natural structure and that's going to be preserved by this action. Um, most of the time I'm, I'm going to quotient by a subset, namely the inner automorphisms of J and the quotient I'll just call home pi J. And this was the space that I was discussing last semester in the character variety seminar as a space that parametrizes locally geometric structures on sigma. Okay. And the, um, the space, which I'll call this um, the representation. Rep pi g. Um, pi g by the inner automorphisms. And this has an action here it is. The outer automorphism group okay. defined as the quotient of automorphism group of pi. By a normal subgroup of inner automorphisms. In the case of a closed surface, this identifies with the mapping class group. Um, you should call it mod sigma modular group, which is a group of isotopy classes of a few morphisms. Homeomorphisms of sigma. Do you yes. have a question by the inner automorphisms of pi? Or just... I could, I'll just take quotients by, by G here, but then I have the act, but I'm interested, what I'll be talking about is the act, the induced action of the quotient by the inner automorphisms of pi. Inner automorphisms act trivial on this thing? That's right. Okay. That's right. Because that's going to be absorbed in the 
into the action by the inner automorphisms of G. For the rep uh, by G, are you quotienting by inner automorphisms or all of G? Um, just by the inner automorphisms of G. Okay. So um, in a moment, I'll describe how an, another approach, but this will correspond to a gauge equivalent. So it's an action of flat connections. Like <clears throat> differential geometry more than um, group theory than flat G connections over, I'll just say over sigma. So I'll say more about this in a moment. But this, this is, These are, it's, a, it's, not, it's useful to be able to play these two um, approaches against each other. Okay, so that's, that's the setting. And this thing, I'll, again, the technique is tries to be. In general, there, there are a lot of pathologies that come up. Um, the HOM pi G is, is an algebraic set, but it might be singular. The action of G on it will be algebraic, but it might not be proper and free. The quotient, therefore, might not, even if you're quotienting just um, non-singular points, the smooth, the top stratum of, of um, smooth points, the quotient might not be smooth, it might be an orbifold, and worse than that, it might not be Hausdorff. So um, I'll say more about the singularities later, but in a very general sense, this is going to be a symplectic manifold, and the mapping class group X. That'll be the, the theme of the talk. So let me um, give the first example. So the first example is the manifolds are vector spaces, and the first example of and one of these spaces will be a symplectic vector space. And that occurs when G is the um, added group of real numbers. In that case, the character variety or representation space, well, first of all, it's hom pi r. So that's whenever G is an abelian group, the space of homo the set of homomorphisms itself forms an abelian group. In, that, in this case, an abelian Lie group. And the action inner automorphisms are trivial. So, and this is just the first real cohomology of sigma. And in that case, this is some, a vector space to dimension twice the genus. And the cut product. So that goes from each one of sigma, sigma, real coefficients, and to H2 of sigma with real coefficients. And remember, um, sigma is an oriented surface. So this is natural. You, the orientation defines an isomorphism of this with the field of real numbers. OK, so this is a symplectic vector space. And the mapping class group is the group of um, homo isotopy classes of homeomorphisms or diffeomorphisms of sigma. That naturally acts on the homology and it preserves the integer lattice. So the mod sigma action, mapping class group action, is just the standard 
action of the group, symplectic group, SP, I think, write it this way. We'll think of Z to the 2G as a free abelian group with a um, symplectic form on it. In this case, we will fix the uh, surface. That's we right. Vary the surface. Right. Right now, I'm just thinking of this as a topological surface. Right, right, right. So, is that what? Oh, I see. So. So we aren't thinking about the calculator. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. okay. In fact, what I'm in, interested in doing is to make put a, complex, a conformal structure on sigma, making it into a Riemann surface, and then seeing how that's the symplectic structure. Um, relates to the um, complex structure. So type Miller space is going to be entering in in a crucial way. Okay, so let me give the general construction. So the tangent, so if we have a representation phi, then <clears throat> it's a point inside this algebraic set so that it has a Zariski tangent space. This is defined by a bunch of equations and the linearization of the equations will define a vector space. If the, um, if we're at a, if the equations define a, um, if, if we're at a regular point for the mapping defined by the relations, then we're at a smooth point and the linearization will give the tangent space by the inverse function theorem. But in general, we may pick up a lot more. And this is, so the tangent space I'll describe as the Zariski tangent space, which would, in general will be much larger than the actual space that we're looking at. Okay. So the Zariski tangent space, okay. And by linearizing the defining equations, the defining equations are phi of x, y equals phi of x, phi of y for homomorphism. And now we imagine taking a deformation of these and seeing what we end up getting. And if we do that, we'll say if we write phi sub t of x as Index. So phi maps into G, U is going to be a map into the Lie algebra. I think of which then can be exponentiated down into G. Okay, so I think that's what I want. And then this equation, this is a nice exercise if you haven't done this, is that this equation linearizes to um, there's a cosophore across from the morphism. And the tangent space will then be the space of one cocycles, group cohomology, or island group and plane cohomology of pi and the corresponding module given by the, this representation. So pi maps into G by the representation, and then G is acting on its Lie algebra by its adjoint representation. And this is exactly the linearization. <clears throat> okay. Now, remember we're quotienting by inner automorphisms of G, and so 
as you might expect, you'll see, start seeing some co-boundaries coming in. And the tangent space at phi to the, to the orbit of the representation. So this is the conjugacy class of the representation. Mg phi, this orbit, that's the space of one through boundaries. And now a, a one co-boundary is a, a form you take, let's see how I do this. We, this is, you imagine taking conjugating by one parameter group. Take a different, this would be an example of a trivial deformation, then the corresponding co-cycle would be something like V minus atoms. That's the traditional definition of a co-boundary in group cohomology. So the, the risky tangent space equivalence class of phi of rep tries to be the homology the coefficients in this representation. Now it's not hard to interpret this in terms of cohomology surface, and I think I'd like to do that since it's geometric. This is the, also the cohomology of sigma with coefficients in the corresponding local system, flat vector model. And now we can think of this as a local system of coefficients, flat vector bundle, and then this is just the Ordinary first cohomology with coefficient twisted cohomology. There. Okay. So when I say try this true B, is that this is can be a pretty bad object in general. But um, if say we're at working at a smooth point and where G is acting locally freely, acting freely, and then this will be a manifold at that point, and this is the tangent space. Now, one of the good points is to get a map in one direction or the other. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're still, I'll be describing the tangent cone in a little, in a, in a moment soon. And in that case, um, you basically get that. But then, even if you're at a smooth point and the action's not free, then it'll be. You'll get a the quotient will have an orbifold structure. It'll be more more delicate, but you do you will get a, a mapping. In any case, it can be analyzed. It's just that it's more technical to describe. Okay, so that's the setting. So now we want to define a symplectic structure. All this. So just as in the, the case of the when G is the real numbers, we'll use cohomology, but now it's more sophisticated cohomology. We have H1 of sigma coefficients in this local system. And in space, we need two copies of this. Here, like linearly. Now that will land you in the second cohomology, so you can cut product. Sigma now it lands in the tensor product of the coefficients. So we need to do something with the co coefficients. 
But remember, we have our two ingredients are the orientation of sigma and a bilinear form, an inner product on the Lie algebra. So inner product of the Lie algebra lets you pair the coefficients in a natural way. And the second homology of so the coefficients and the orientation defines a map to the scalars. Okay. Well, there are two things that are easy to, to check. This thing is skew symmetric. I'll call this thing omega of phi. So if you you say simple, if you work the it's basically a tensor product of cup product and dimension one, which is skew symmetric, and a symmetric coefficient pairing. So that'll be skew symmetric. It's non degenerate, which follows from the non degeneracy of the coefficient pairing together with Poincare duality. Um, so that we have an exterior two form over our space. Um, the more subtle question is whether it's closed, which it is. It's not so easy to prove from general considerations. But let me describe how it, you can prove it, but in, which in, in a very conceptual way, and that's that um, to interpret in terms of flat connections. This is the Durham version. So this might this is going to be called the Betty version. So we interpret it as in gauge theory. Okay, so something about yes. For instance, if I have an embedding of two Lie groups, right, uh, and two you know two inner products somehow that are you know, a covariance. Will I get a symplectic embedding of the corresponding? Yes. I think so. I have a, I'm pretty sure it will. Yeah. Because just by restriction. OK, so the point is now we have a representation the representation P, the representation phi defines a principal bundle, flat principal bundle. The total space of a piece of phi, and that's obtained as follows. You take the universal covering surface, sigma, take the trivial bundle, principal G bundle, and then quotient by the action of the fundamental group. So by that I the action is given as follows that we have an element gamma and pi, a deck transformation of sigma tilde, then <clears throat> that will act as follows. It takes a point x tilde from G and we apply the deck transformation over the base. And then multiply on the left by phi of gamma. So that's a nice proper action because it covers the proper action of um, pi on its on sigma tilde deck transformations. And that's going to be the total space, then the projection onto the quotient given by the first. It's just the, Fiber bundle. Okay. And the um, point is, this has a natural flat connection. I guess I'll call that zero. Okay. 
And that just comes from the um, trivial connection on the product, just the product bundle and to the horizontal subspaces for the connection will just be the um, <clears throat> points of the form X tilde across the, the Lie group G. No, no, I mean, copies of sigma tilde across a fixed element in the fiber G. So that's the, that's the flat connection. And the, um, connect, the set of all connections on P Call that A of P. This is a, um, an affine space. Two different connections differ by affine space whose underlying vector space of translations coarser for the vector space of one forms on sigma coefficients in the local system defined by. It's actually the same local system I was describing before, but I'm calling it add p. This in terms of the principal bundle, this is the associated bundle, p, the fiber product of p cross g. g is acting by the adjoint representation. And this is, this is a vector, inf infinite dimensional vector space, but it's a symplectic vector space. Namely, if we have two one forms taking values in this vector bundle, then we can take their exterior product, their wedge product, and then use the bilinear form B to pair the coefficients. And so this is a symplectic vector space acting simply transitively on this affine space. So this is now a symplectic affine space. In particular, the symplectic the exterior form that's defined, that's why will be closed. And then the representation space will be the corresponding symplectic quotient, Marston Weinstein quotient. A G mod G is the symplectic quotient. And to define a symplectic quotient, we need two things. We have an action. Group, and that's going to be the gauge group. E. We have mappings of principal bundle P, and then automorphisms that covering the identity. That's that will preserve the parallel symplectic structure on the affine space, and. It's a Hamiltonian action that's going to have a collective Hamiltonian, which is going to be a moment. So the, um, the gauge group is the group of sections of the ad adjoint bundle. So that, in other words, at each point over sigma, we have an um, automorphism given by an inner automorphism of G, conjugation by G. And so we have a section of those. So the Lie algebra gauge group, sections of the 
corresponding Lie algebra bundle, in other words, zero forms sigma with coefficients and um, Now, <clears throat> the moment map goes from the symplectic manifold, which is in this case the base of all connections, into the dual of the Lie algebra. Dual. In that case, the dual to the Lie algebra will just be the space of two forms. By concrete duality. Now, now on the different level of differential forms. And the um, as you might guess, you take a non-recurry connection, which I'll write as the base connection plus a tensor A. That will go into the curvature. Is just going to be the differential, the covariant differential of all of A. Exterior bracket. Okay. These are values, takes values here. So, so this is um, the um, the curvature. This will be equivariant with respect to the natural action of the gauge group. And you take the level set of this plant connections quotient by the gauge group, and that will inherit a symplectic structure. So this um, construction is um, due to originally this was first written down not in terms of symplectic quotient, but the form for the um, the form for the um, symplectic product by Narasimha, 1970, I think, and then interpreted as a moment map by the Tia and Bot. The famous paper on the Yang Mills equations on Riemann surfaces. And so this gives an interpretation in terms of um, gauge theory and <clears throat> in particular gives a nice proof that the form is closed. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, I, did, I didn't realize it was in such generality. Well, well, they restrict the case when G is compact. Right, right. Um, well, because they were trying to do some analysis. Right, so, exactly. Okay, yeah. Right. So in, what they get is even better. And this is important. Yeah, 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 yeah. They get a Kähler quotient. Right. So the manifolds are, so this, in the case when G is compact, right. then you, you get a Hermitian vector space. And then you get a, a, a Kähler manifold. Um, but for this symplectic discussion, you don't need G to be compact, just to be orthogonal. So, okay. excuse me, the choice of the inner program. Um, well, in the case of a compact group, um, in the case of a compact group, it doesn't. There's or a, or a reductive group, it, it doesn't really matter. There, there's really a, only one on each simple factor. If you have a simple Lie group, there's one up to scaling. Um, so it's basically canonical. It'll be the, in the case of a semi-simple contact group, then just take the killing form. You can weight them differently if, it, if it's not a simple group, if it's a direct product. So you get several. You'll hear several. There. But uh, when you interpret this form as uh, the one that's coming from the Atia construction, then it doesn't really, yeah, I think it's, it's all synthetic morphism. Right, I think so. 
Um, and so this may not be so satisfying because it's we have this finite dimensional problem of homo products of matrices satisfying polynomial equations. So it's sort of finite, it's, a, it's finite dimensional and purely finite dimensional proofs. Where first one was done by Yael Karshan and then Alan Weinstein in the, in the floor memorial volume gave. Um, expanded on Karshan's proof, uh, then Johannes Hupschman and Lisa Jeffrey. Found finite dimensional proofs of the form is closed. Using some very interesting. Um, very interesting application of equivariant homology, differential differential forms in algebraic homology. Itself is maybe more Excuse complicated me. in itself, maybe more complicated than the infinite dimension. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's quite as conceptual. It involves a fair. It involves a lot of machinery. Right, right. Well, yeah, it gives right. more. I mean, it, anything equivariant always involves a lot of machinery. Yeah, the, well, yeah, it, it yields new results too because it, it, it has applications for finding higher dimensional cohomology classes. In. Um, maybe I'll put off the discussion of the other compact groups for a moment, just to mention another case. In fact, the case that got me interested in this, and that's when G is non-compact, G is PSL2R. What I was describing in some of the lectures in the fall. In that case, this is the group of isometric orientation preserving isometries of the hyperbolic plane. And representations of surface groups in G arise naturally from hyperbolic geometry and putting hyperbolic structures on surfaces. And instead of um, hyperbolic geometry structures, naturally embeds inside the representation space. That's a good component. This space I'll call the Fricka space. It's naturally isomorphic to the Teichmuller space. Mark three months surfaces. I want to emphasize the distinction because this has a much different role in the sense of um, corresponding to geometric structures, whereas this is a space of analytic structures. But um, and I want to use Teichmuller space in a different way later using the conformal structure. And this is um, the type of space is most known to be a Taylor manifold. It has a natural Taylor structure called Dave Peterson 
these cameras structure. It's um, defined complex analytically, the tangent space of tight pillar space is a complex vector space of a Beltram Beltrami differentials, which has an actual um, complex structure. Uniformizing it, you can represent these things by automorphic forms, and the Paterson pairing on, on automorphic forms is a Hermitian pairing, which defines a um, Hermitian structure. And the fact that this Hermitian structure is a Kähler structure, which is the condition that the Kähler form is closed, that you get a symplectic manifold, is I, I think that was first proved by all force, maybe independently by by the a complex structure. What is the connected component? Yeah, that's right. I thought this this was like this hitching component part of yes, it's the hitching component. Higher dimensions is part of right, exactly. That's in fact, it's it's that, it's that that I'm being so pedantic about calling this Fricka space and that Teichmiller space because in what's called higher Teichmiller theory, you have other components that will be like the Fricka space, and the the Teichmiller space comes in in a key role, but it's not the same. So I want to separate them too. And then I mean, the uniformization theorem is a wonderful fact. It's so wonderful that you're tempted to use it all the time. And so hyperbolic geometry is sometimes called Teichmiller theory. And I don't think Teichmiller ever studied hyperbolic geometry, but many theorems about Teichmiller space have improved using hyperbolic geometry via the uniformization theorem. And in fact, in Hitchens' original paper, he shows that the um, uniformization theorem follows from one of the main theorems and that he, he proves in setting up you know, Higgs bundles and the self-duality equations. Anyway, so this so there's a natural symplectic structure coming from the Bay Peterson geometry and um, the um, Bay Peterson Kähler form arises from this construction. Or the interpretation of the representation. So this is only one connected component. So the other components provide interesting examples of symplectic manifolds, which I don't think really have been studied too much. Not too much is known about it. It's rather interesting to note that this is actually that this this Taylor theory is um, invariant of the mapping question. Okay. Um, my my interest in this subject began from the work of Scott Wolford in the late nineteen seventies where he showed that there was a very close connection between the symplectic geometry and hyperbolic geometry on the surface. In particular, he showed that the Fenchel-Nielsen twist, twist vector fields are Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian flows for the geodesic length functions. So this may be familiar to, to many of you. Let me describe what this means. Um, hyperbolic geometry on surfaces Also involves a um, moment map and completely integrable system. Namely, you start with a decomposition of your surface into a three hole sphere, in other words, pairs of pants. So 
So if you have a surface of each pants, it's the Euler characteristic, characteristic minus one. The Euler characteristic of the surface is two G minus two, two minus two G. So that means that if we have pants decomposition, there are going to be two G minus two pants. Now, <clears throat> each three hole sphere has three boundary components and each boundary component abuts two pants. So the number of curves, three halves, g minus two, three g minus three, we'll just call n. And then natural, if we have a hyperbolic structure, then we have curves, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. It's genus two, so n equals three. Then we have a map from the Fricka space into um, positive real numbers to the nth power, given by taking the lengths. So each one of these curves can be represented by a simple closed geodesic. And we take the lengths of those geodesics and that gives a map into here. So we then cut the surface up along these pants and we have a bunch of um, three hold spheres with geodesic boundary. If two of them are to be identified, they have the same length, but then there are many ways of reassembling them. And the way that you reassemble them is by a fenchel Nielsen twist. Later, Thurston called these things earthquakes. And these, these are deformations where you just rotate one side relative to the other. And this describes an RN action, and it'll be a Hamiltonian RN action. Given by the, by the twist. Just to repeat, we, we have two, two of these three whole spheres. We basically rotate one relative to the other. The deformation will be trivial on each one, but then on the union, it will generally be non trivial or will be non trivial. Okay, and so this again is, a, is an example of a moment map for a complete system. And now if we take a section of this map, and there, there are several ways of doing it, but it's less canonical than the map itself, namely ways of starting with a bunch of three whole spheres and identifying them naturally, then you get coordinates. I mean, from the hyperbolic geometry, which we used by Fenchel and Nielsen. Lengths, which are more natural, a twist parameter, a tau. Coordinates, and Wolpert proved, let's hold this magic formula, these Fenchel Nielsen coordinates are dot or root coordinates for the symplectic form. Namely, the symplectic form is a sum of the ally which detail. So this is the, the other motivation. And this gets into, generalizes to higher type Miller theory and, and other ones. How is this a section? Well, um, so do I, maybe I, I want to think of the, 
I mean, the question is, where do you set tau equals zero? We have well-defined vector fields. So these are action, you can think of these as action angle coordinates too. So the action zero the lengths and the angles are. The complete, this is a complete integrable system. Right. So we have an explicit representation in terms of these nice geometric coordinates. I mean, it's sort of remarkable in a way because the, the original definition of the Vey Peterson permission metric was defined complex analytically. And, and then the symplectic form was basically just algebraic topology. So, how do you associate the, the, the coordinates with the Original definition of um, of well, it's the uniformization theorem that identifies a Riemann surface. Yeah, but how do you see, how do you, how do you see those coordinates are? Right? Well, in okay, case so yeah, this is what um, I learned from Scott was that you um, you represent the tangent space by harmonic Beltrami differentials. And then um, the, there's the Shimura isomorphism that represents automorph. And then these can be identified with holomorphic quadratic differentials. And then there's this. So it's really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, not that. It's, it's involved. It involves some homological algebra. I see that Bob Gunning is, is, is watching. You can read a lot about this in his book lectures on Riemann surfaces. Nice description of the um, the pair the Hermitian pairing in terms of the fundamental group of the surface. Um, right. So you there. It's this the Shimura isomorphism is a way of going from. You're basically how do you define the period of a of a holomorphic quadratic differential represented as an automorphic form? Then you have to. Um, is a little bit of a diagram chase. But how do you show, maybe that's what, what she was asking, how do you show this two is actually corresponds to Hamiltonian flow to lens? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is something that I learned from John Nelson, that we have this, um, we have a, a tangent vector. Right, so what, what are we trying to do? So we have, have this length function associated to a curve alpha. Okay. And we want to see how, how that's a, we want to see what identify that as the twist vector field. So how do we do that? So th what is this thing? This is going to be a, at each point in, in rep, we have a tangent vector, it's a vector field. And so what is the vector? The vector field is going to correspond to an element. Now, we, Poincare, we have Poincare duality because the coefficient system is orthogonal using B to identify this with the dual to H1, the sigma coefficients here. And then the right model for this will be maybe some sort of, let's say, simplicial cohomology with respect to a triangulation of sigma. And so we want to represent this as a cycle with a coefficient. And by going, going through the isomorphisms like the Poincare duality, and the definition of the length function, the differential of the length function, then this can be represented as a, a simple closed curve alpha, and then represent this as a um, cycle with a coefficient. And so this will correspond in the universal cover to a, a, a closed geodesic, and then the coefficient you'll associate will be the Killen vector field that is the infinitesimal isometry along that. Okay, so once you identify the Hamiltonian vector field with the value of the Hamiltonian vector field at a given point with this 
homology class than observing on how that relates to the cohomology and the infinitesimal deformations, you see that it's given by, a, by the twist vector field. I mean, this is it's certainly believable because any this cycle is going to be supported on just that curve. So the way the um, representation of the fundamental group will vary will be constant along any curve that's disjoint from it. And then for curves that aren't disjoint, then it'll be measured by how it intersects that curve. And you see that it corresponds to this operation of um, just re-gluing along the, the map. Okay, are there any other? So I think I am running out of time. So I close with some open questions that I wanted to get to about this. Um, so the symplectic geometry I've described. One motivation was through hyperbolic geometry and type number theory. Um, the other was through gauge theory. Um, I described the case when G is the added group of real numbers, but closely related is when G is the circle, the unitary group. And in that case, the representation is abelian again. So the representation space, the moduli space, the deformation space is just the um, homomorphisms in the V, which is naturally the torus of vector space. By the integer lattice. This is the R to the 2G, not G to the 2G. I mean, if you almost take a point in tight corner space, that is a Mark Riemann surface. Then the construction I described um, will give rise to a Taylor structure. And this represents that as the Jacobi variety, the Riemann surface. So this parameterizes the um, topologically trivial homomorphic line bundles over the Riemann surface X. So the underlying symplectic structure is the same. This is just given by the, this is going to be given by a parallel constant symplectic structure. On the two G torus. So natural question is, so I've been asking various people here, what's known about the symplectomorphisms of the 2G torus. And in particular, we have the linear ones, the ones that are mapping class group. How does this group sit inside the symplectomorphisms? Now, it's not hard to see that they have flex zero, so that the Hamiltonian. But it's interesting to observe the Torelli theorem. That can be stated as saying that the um, Kähler structure on the Jacobian determines the Riemann structure, determines 
planetary curve space. So, okay. I guess it's not real. Doesn't seem to be known what what the um, some plectomorphism group of the of the torus is. But we we ha we have there's a mapping. Maybe it's better to write this mapping. No, there's a part. So I've described a mapping here, but then there's also a projection by looking at the homology, the action on homology. This is one one question that I think is is interesting. Let me close with a another question. I think that's interesting along the same lines. Going back to the Nara Simon and Atiyah Bot theory, um, say when G is equal to SU2 or any compact group, but let's just take the case of SU2. That's the action of the other of group, right? That's right. That's right. You see, so they're all the. Um, well, right. Yeah, the, the that's for, for the torus, but then the, then there will be elements that act trivially on, on homology. So presumably they're going to be not outside this. So I think to that, whether that's a homotopy, that seems unlikely to be a homotopy equivalence. But I really don't know anything. For, I guess G equals one. This is just action of SL two Z. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's well understood. And, but above that, I don't think maybe maybe for genus two, there's some hope because they're here before Taurus. Right. Wait, so it, I, you said that actions Hamiltonian. I mean, aren't those not in the identity component, or am I just being really dumb? Oh, um, let's see, what do I want to say? You can also address this after, but I yeah, let me address it afterwards. Yeah, yeah there's right, that's a good point, but I. Maybe maybe I was thinking that modular. Yeah, let's. I think convince right. Okay, let's talk about it. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt. Okay, so so when G is SU two, and in general, the generalization of the Jacobian representation space is the um, identifies with the space of moduli space of semi-stable homomorphic bundles, semi-stable rank two homomorphic vector bundles. But as a symplectic manifold, there's only one, but this also there's an analog of the Torelli theorem that um, this is a projective variety, molecular structure. Determines the Riemann surface set. So this last question is even more vague, and that's um, to what extent. So we have again, we now have the mapping class group of sigma, and this will be acting. That goes into the symplectomorphism group. Of, the representation space. And the question is, how does one characterize the symplectomorphisms of the arising from mapping classes? Right? Is there some, they seem very natural. Um, if, if you can, I'm, what I'm, what I'd somehow would like to see some way of bringing in the space of Kaler structures on this. I don't think it's known that any Kaler structure on this moduli space arises from, from this construction in algebraic geometry. On the other hand, if there is some way of characterizing the, the Kaler structures in terms of type space, and then showing that a symplectomorphism acts on that and acts holomorphically, then you can apply Royden's theorem that the group of biholomorphisms of type Miller space 
is the mapping class group. So is there some way of recovering the Teichmuller space as a space, a natural space arising from the symplectic geometry of these spaces? So the, I'll close with the case that's most well studied. That's when the genus is equal to two. Then, well, it's, it's, a, it's I didn't, I was hoping to say something about the singularities of the spaces, but I won't. But in this case, it, it's, um, there, are two, there are two cases of odd degree bundles. And these have been studied with Peter Newstead in his thesis and Nara Simmons, Sashadri, and Ramanan. early 60s. In that case, you get a very, what I think is a very interesting symplectic six manifold, which is simply connected. It's um, second Betty number is one, so it's generated by the symplectic form. And then it's third, the middle dimensional cohomology is isomorphic to the first cohomology of the surface. So it's rank four. And it looks like a very interesting um, symplectic manifold, which has a symplectic action of the uh, genus two mapping class group. Um, the case of even degree is also fascinating. In this case, the space has reducible representations, which will be singular points in the um, cohomology. You can the cohomology will jump now and even though it's um, topologically smooth, it's a topological manifold. Self is surprising. It's diffeomorphic, it's homeomorphic. CP3. So the natural question is is it symplectomorphic to CP3 in some sense? Think anything is really known, or even whether that makes sense, because the, um, the fact that it's homeomorphism it may involve a homeomorphism that's not. But you do have this invariant Kummer surface of um of the singular corresponding to the, the U one representations, which will be invariant under the mapping class group. So these look like very interesting places places to study. Homeomorphic to CP3 is the whole representation space. Yeah, well, I was a little bit sloppy here. So the, these are the only ones that correspond to representations, but these correspond to what you might call twisted representations, where the product of the commutators is not the identity, but minus the identity. So SU2 has center with consisting of plus or minus one, and the odd degree homomorphic bundles correspond to, the, to these twisted so these are central extensions of the, if you want the, the, every, everything I've said will go through for these to get a symplectic action. These have been well studied as far as the algebraic geometry. Looks like a promising area to study. So thank you very much. Questions? Yes, thank you. Do you have this? Free K component, and you mentioned some other components with selected structure. Yeah, it's a very vague question, but um, like it was a complete integrable system. It was a simple manifold. Can you actually obtain something more uh, complicated by just pulling stuff similar to cluster? Well, let's see. So this is for what for what Lee group? Uh, for whichever, uh, like for uh, for Lee pulls uh, yeah. PSL two is good. Well, for PSL2R, the other components are not contractible. So you won't get the same kind of completely integrable systems. And, and it follows from Hitchens' self duality equations paper that these things are isomorphic, that these are homomorphic to, to bundles over, um, let's see, they're, they're vector, holomorphic, total spaces of holomorphic vector bundles over a symmetric product of the curve of the Riemann surface. So that's very interesting topology. Um, 
And, and the conjecture is that the action is ergodic on these other components, and then that's been proved in for genus two, for PSL2R. It's actually not quite ergodic, but it's for the, the Euler class zero component. For SL3R, then you've got the Hitchin component, which corresponds to complex real projective structures on the surface. And that's the first model example of a higher type in our space. And the action is proper on that. But then there's another component, which is not, which comes, well, there are two other components, one which has odd um, in characteristic class, which will be like the odd degree one here. But, um, and, and then there's another one that has, that's not detected by characteristic class and that contains the trivial representation. And that, I, I'm not, I think that's probably, and that may be known, but it's, it's singular. So the question about what it's cohomology is maybe a little bit. But the other components are not complete integrable system. Right. The, that's just in the case for the Hitchin component for the convex real projective structures. Um, I know a lot of people that have been working on this, and you don't get an analog. You have there are various attempts to get analogs of Fenchel Nielsen coordinates, but the sort of basic structure falls apart. So mm -hmm. you, it's still contractible. And I, I, I found coordinates that show you that you get the, the um, that the space that that component is is a cell. But it used sort of internal parameters that we're not that we're not depending a pair of pants. So if you have in this case, once you fix the conjugates and class of the representations on the boundary, there's still more parameters. And that's an interesting question about how to represent that. Um, the I think the nicest and most conceptual way is this work of Falk and Gontrov, where they um, use some um, sort of triple ratios invariants for SL3R that are that give rise to sort of the internal parameters once you fix the boundary structures. But this doesn't happen for SL2, which is one reason that everything works out so nicely. So, you know, an interesting question about finding good coordinates. And the, and the coordinates of Hawk and Gonshaw give. I think it's sort of a there's sort of there's sort of a tor it's sort of a toric structure, and this is and these they'll seem to come up a lot in this other work I was describing of if you do the, what I was talking about for SU two and try to get there where, where the topology is known to be complicated, then uh, Lisa Jeffrey and Jonathan Whitesmith define sort of a toric structure on that. Open subset, but you can't have too nice a structure because of the singularities and the, the fact that the twist vector fields are will, will vanish at certain points. So. Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker again.